Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. If you've been following along this week, you know that we are celebrating our ocean. So we've been talking to different ocean scientists and explorers from all over the world who've dedicated their life not only to studying our oceans, but also protecting them. Because I'm sure in many of your classrooms, you know we haven't been the best stewards uh, of our ocean, whether it's ocean plastics, whether it's overfishing or global warming, uh, that's causing a uh, breakdown of our coral reefs. We need to do better to protect our ocean. And even if we live far away from the ocean, it still impacts our daily life. So it's really important that we pay attention and look for uh, these solutions. Now, before we meet today's guest, really excited to have Joe joining us today. I'm gonna take a moment and share my screen. We're gonna use National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive and get a feel for where everyone's joining us live from today. So here we go, screen is sharing. So I am here in a little village called Alora uh, in Ontario, Canada. So as we start to back up a little bit more, we're gonna see some of our classrooms start to come uh, into perspective. So we have classrooms joining us in Godrich today, classrooms joining us uh, in Smooth Rock Falls. So a few Canadian classrooms. As we move down a little bit more, you can see we have classrooms in Connecticut, in New Jersey, Maryland. And if we back up a little bit more, we can see we have classroom in Missouri today. We've got a classroom joining us in Edmonton, Alberta. And then if I go down, 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 down here and we zoom in a little bit, uh, we can see a rough image where this fish is, Joe joining us off the coast of California. So as I come back from that screen share, I wanna remind any classroom who's tuning in with us uh, live on YouTube, you can still get in on the action, use the chat sidebar on the right, let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions and we'll work them in. And any classroom who's joining us, whether you're on camera or on YouTube, Take some pictures, share them on Twitter, hashtag Explore Classroom, tag at Nat Geo Education. We love to see classrooms in action. All right, that's enough out of me. Let's get to the main event. We are joined by Joe Cutler today. Joe is a National Geographic Explorer, an ichthyologist, uh, which is someone who studies fish, if you don't know, and a conservationist. So he's very interested in the biodiversity of freshwater species in lakes. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Cameroon, and he currently works with the Nature Conservancy in Gabon. So he's conducted several fish sampling expeditions, collecting hundreds of fish species, including dozens uh, that are new to science. So you may notice that Joe is outside. He is down at the Rocky Intertidal. He is using one of our textbook size satellite units to broadcast from somewhere with no uh, internet connectivity and he is going to take us on a little tour and see what we can find. So Joe, thanks so much. We're super excited. Let's get exploring. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks to all students and teachers for joining us and anybody who's on YouTube. Good morning, it's great to have you. And welcome to the Rocky Inner Title. Uh, this is one of my favorite ecosystems. While Joe said I study freshwater to Africa primarily, when I'm home, this is one of my favorite places to explore. Um, right now, I'm in Central California, right on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. Um, I've got the ocean to my right and uh, a coastal terrace here to, to my left. And as far as the eye can see, there's nothing but me, the rocks, the ocean, and lots of life and biodiversity. So this is one of my favorite ecosystems I've been exploring it since I was a kid, and I'm really excited to share some of the diversity that's out here with you and kind of explore the Rocky Intertidal together. Um, so one of the reasons that the Rocky Intertidal is so cool is it is the transition between the ocean and land. And so I'm gonna turn my camera around and just kind of pan from the offshore Rocky Intertidal to the coast side, and you'll see kind of the, let me flip this around. Okay, so we're looking out to the Pacific and there's some big rocks in between me and the open ocean. That's one of the reasons why I can be this far out and still be protected from the waves. But if you look at the top of the rocks there um, and you look down all the way to the water, you'll see that the, the color of the rocks kind of change. And that's because different species of algae and invertebrates are colonizing that rock. And as, you, as I pan, you'll see that different species are living on the different rocks. And as you move from the offshore environment toward the inshore environment, um, 
the, the species and composition of the community changes. So there's a lot of diversity in this ecosystem um, in a pretty small area. And there's really intense competition for space. There's really intense predation. And there's a lot of species packed in this area that you can't find unless you're out in the open ocean. Uh, so it's really cool to be able to be here. Now, the area where I'm standing right now actually is usually covered with about a foot or two of ocean. Um, right now, we're at a pretty low tide, so the water is sucked back out, and it's given me about 100 meters of rocky intertidal to explore here. Now, I'm not going to explore the whole thing through this live stream. I'm just going to walk around this rock here, and you're going to be amazed at all the stuff we can find. So with that, I'm going to hop down off my perch and start exploring. So can you still see what I'm seeing? Yeah, we've got your view, Joe. Perfect. So you can see that the rocks here are just covered with life. It's hard to even find an inch where there's something not growing, whether it be kelp or barnacles or encrusting kelp. This is another species of barnacle. You can just see that life is packed in this area. And there is some life that is really bizarre. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with seeing that. But this animal is very to a jellyfish, except it has its life attached to the, to the bottom, putting in the ocean. Now, these animals have pulls right behind me. Take that one out. I'm turning around here. I'm moving to the far side of this pool. And hopefully the glare is not too bad. Oops. But you can see this is an actively feeding sea anemone. And these are its tentacles. Much like a jellyfish, these actually have stinging cells on their tentacles. And this individuals trying to sting me, trying to digest me, pull me into its mouth, which is right here in the center of the disc. And what's interesting about this animal is it only has one opening. It doesn't have a mouth and a butt. It only has a mouth slash butt. So um, what it does to eat is it actually sticks its stomach out of its mouth and engulfs, engulfs whatever it's trying to eat. Um, thankfully, uh, its stinging cells aren't that powerful, so it didn't hurt me to stick my finger in it. But it's kind of a cool thing uh, to, to find here. And as we move up a little bit more, you can see two more anemones here. Both of these are closed up. And they do that to avoid desiccation or drying out. Because they live in this intertidal area, sometimes they're underwater, sometimes they're above water. So this is really a good strategy to avoid losing water. And a lot of the species that live here are adapted to maintain their water once the tide goes out, and then they feed more actively when they're submerged. So, whoops, I'm gonna try not to slip as I move forward here, just kind of ascending a little crack in the rocks. And actually we've got some other anemones here, and this, this is actually a different species than the last one I showed you. This is called the sunburst in radiating lines, oral disc, and distinctive characteristics of the species. Um, and it's quite, be quite large. I mean, this individual is probably four or five inches wide, um, and they're very beautiful. Now, if you see that shell here, um, this... This is an eggshell. Uh, we have abalone here on the West Coast, but they're pretty rare. And actually, they've been overfished so thoroughly that all of the fishery is closed for abalone. So if we're lucky, we may find an abalone on this tour, but they're very uncommon, uh, mostly due to humans overexploiting them. Okay, moving up this little 
tide pool here. Um, what have we got? And obviously, I'm walking by so much diversity without talking about it. I'm just looking for the highlights to some degree. What you're seeing is the inner side of the sea so that you can see it's, it's back and it's coloration here. So this is Deptisterius. It's a six-rayed sea star with pretty spiny, uh, spiny arms. Uh, and they're tiny. This individual is not huge, but it's probably uh, an average-sized individual. And there are other sea stars in this community that are much larger than this one. Um, I don't know if you can see that tiny white dot on its back, but that's actually called the madriporite, and it's the open thing. So, Joe, if you can still hear me, you might have moved a little too far from the unit. You're breaking up on us a little bit. Okay. Maybe it's that I'm down in a crack. That's possible. You might not have Is a good still... line of sight. Tell me. Uh... Okay. You're coming in much better now. Let me know. If... Perfect. I was just down in a crack, so that was probably my issue. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff lives in cracks, so... I'm going to do my best to stay high and also show you what I'm looking at. Um, you can see another big anemone here, and it's got a piece of kelp hanging over it. Now, this is a giant green anemone, and you can see that it's just big and green. Um, and... This is anemone here in, in this area. Uh, again, these things will sting you, but you won't feel it on your fingers uh, because the skin on your fingers is too thick. One of the things that I love to do in the inner title is to kind of look in the cracks and crevices. So this is a little crack here, and I'm going to show you, ideally, there's a chitin. You see that? stripy red uh, organism. That's an ancestral snail. And I'm going to pull back up just because I assume that you guys were kind of losing reception down in that hole. But that is one of the most beautiful snails that lives out here. Uh, and it's a really interesting species because it's an ancestral snail. So most snails have a single shell and it sits on top of their head. And actually their bodies undergo a process called torsion which is a process where instead of their gut going from head to tail, their gut kind of turns around and comes over their head. So their butt's like kind of above their head. These snails don't have that. And they actually have a linear gut and, and eight different plates. So rather than having one shell, these, these snails have eight shells, which is kind of cool. Um, and that species, the flame line chitin, is probably one of the most beautiful in this area. Um, I'm going to turn the camera around again. Joe, Joe, please let me know if... Uh, yeah. yeah, you're coming in, in nicely, but I wanted to... Uh, Mrs. Ball's class in uh, Godrich, Ontario, they have to go shortly. They were just tuning in uh, for the beginning part. I'm going to let them squeeze a question in before they have to go. Totally. But Perfect. Feel free to continue the tour, but Mrs. Ball's class in Godrich, how are you guys doing? Good. Good. All right. Does someone have a quick question for Joe? I know you guys have to leave shortly. Yeah, we were just wondering what kind of impacts he's seen on the tide pools there. You know, this area is actually pretty pristine, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do the live stream from here. This is an area that very few people actually get to. Um, so this area is pretty good. Most of the impacts and changes I see here are natural. So these tide pools change seasonally. During the big storms, when there's an influx of fresh water, you actually see a lot of species will die out. And right now in the springtime, 
where there's a lot of sunlight coming in, we're moving towards summer, there's a huge bloom of algae. So there is more kelp and algae out here than there is the rest of the year. So in this area, I don't see that many anthropogenic impacts. That said, the last time I was out here, I found a bird wrapped up in a balloon string dead in the intertidal. So there are definitely human impacts that make it here. Um, and that, that, that bird was probably killed offshore and was blown in. Um, but human impacts are global, unfortunately. All Even right. In remote Thank areas. Yeah. Thanks so much, Goddard Ontario, for joining in. Uh, Joe, let's continue the tour. Cool. Okay. I'm going to continue up and over this little rocky area here and do my best not to slip over this incredibly slick algae. I'm going to actually pause right here. These are some species right in this clearing that usually this and this and this. These are actually limpets. Those are also snails. And they're easily overlooked because their shells are really flattened. So they suck onto the rocks, especially out. And uh, you can just, they get covered in algae and they look just like a rock. So they're very camouflaged. It's easy to not see them. But next to these limpets, these are barnacles. And these are adult barnacles um, in the genus Thalamus. And these are as big as they're going to get. And if we looked around the rocks here, these things would be absolutely everywhere. You've got encrusting algaes, coralline algaes, pink volcano barnacles, uh, phragmatopoma tube worms. The amount of life, especially small life out here is absolutely incredible. Um, and if you just take the time to lay on your stomach for a while and just look at an area, you find new things every time you're out here. So I'm going to continue up and over this rock and kind of drop back down into the water. Because earlier today, I found a very beautiful nudibranch over here. Oh, I see it again. <coughs> okay. Ready for the most beautiful thing that we'll see all day? It's tiny, I will warn you. Okay, let me... Get the glare figured out. Hopkins, this is a nudibranch. It's a sea slug and it is hot pink, obviously. And those are not tentacles on its back. Those are actually gills. So these are outpocketings of the mantle used to increase surface area so that it can get its oxygen. Um, and you might be wondering, why in the world is this little... Sorry, I'm having trouble with this cord. Okay, why in the world is this little sea slug so pink? You know, this is the brightest thing in the inner title. It's pink because it's poisonous. It's called aposematic coloration. So species that are poisonous, like poison arrow frogs, a lot of nudibranchs, uh, you know, a lot of moths, they're really brightly colored as a warning, as a, as a warning that, hey, I've got chemical defenses, and if you bite into me, it's probably not going to taste good. So this is called a Hopkins rose. It's probably one of the most beautiful of the nudibranchs. And uh, what a alien creature that is um i absolutely love it i'm glad that it didn't go too far since i found it this morning um and this is another great spot where you can see kind of the zonation on the rocks so you can see this transitioning habitat right here in front of me um so at the top of the rocks you have these small let me get up at the top of the rocks you have these small kind of uh, bunch grasses, seemingly. And as we move down, you get into some laminaria kelp. And as we move further down yet, you can see that we're getting into other species. Um, and so this really shows kind of how quickly 
the intertidal changes with vertical, uh, just kind of a drop in your, your height um, in the intertidal. And it's really amazing that there are species adapted to each one of these zones as you move around here. Now I mentioned earlier, I like to look around in caves. And one of the reasons I like to look in caves is actually the cave areas stay more wet. So you will find species that are found deeper in the, in the ocean inside of a cave. So I'm going to take my here and do orange material coral and they're really quite beautiful they build a a a, a structure house that they live in and then when the they stick out their tentacles to feed now all of these individuals in right now they are which is kind of cool now i had been going i had been going to the Rocky Intertidal since I was a kid, and I never found these things until I was adult. So uh, there's a lot to find out here, and I absolutely love it. So, Joe, what were those What's, called? Uh, we lost you for a second. I'm going to turn this around. What were those called? Uh, those are called orange cup corals, and they are a solitary coral species um, that live here in the Rocky Intertidal, and they build a calcium carbonate base that they sit in, a little cup, and then they feed when the tide's in, and then they suck in their tentacles when the tide is out. All right. I so see go. another bright, yeah. I was gonna say, while you're heading to the next uh, thing, we have a question from online from Mrs. Lee's group in Ottawa, Ontario, and they're wondering, what do you like the most about being an ichthyologist? You know, I love biodiversity, and I just love, Seeing new species every time I encounter something that I've never seen before. It's one of the most exciting things ever. And being an ichthyologist, there are 35,000 fish species that have been described. And there are probably more than 50,000 fish species globally. So there's a lot more to discover. And where I work in Central Africa, we are discovering new species pretty regularly. And it is unbelievably exciting to pull your net through a river that nobody else has ever fished in. Um, I feel like I really get to be on the, the interface between science and exploration and discovery. And I love what I do. Um, and you can see I've got a nice bat star here. This is another sea star species, um, Pateria miniata. And I'm going to turn it over so you can see kind of how it gets around. Um, so these are rows of tube feet. Um, and I don't know if you can see the texture on them but they have basically tube feet protected by these little spines. And you can see the tube feet are wiggling all around. Um, and then right in the center is where its mouth is. And so these things, much like the anemones, they stick their mouth out. They don't have any jaws. They stick their stomach out of their mouth to digest whatever they're trying to digest. Um, and interestingly, the terminal tentacles on the end of the, of the rays actually have things like primitive eyes. So they have photo sensors on the ends of their, of their arms, which is kind of incredible. Um, so that's a nice little bat star. You can see it's kind of armored with little overlapping plates. And this one also has a madreporite, the opening to the water vascular system, but it's much smaller and less visible than the last one. So I'm going to put that one back in the water where I found it. When you're in the intertidal or anywhere in nature, you always want to leave it in the same way that you found it, in the same condition. So, Joe, as you now, I'm hoping that, I'm gonna as you jump yeah. to another spot. I want to fire in another question. Um, this one is from Mrs. Krenecki's class. They're joining us in um, uh, Colchester, Connecticut, and they're wondering, you know, what inspired you to do things like this to get out. Uh, and explore these ecosystems. What what led you to want to do this? Oh, I think everybody wants to do this. You know, I think if you add, I, I, I oh.
eh, dreamt about it. I dreamt about going to these unexplored areas and being the first person to find something. And I find it amazing how much of the world is left to explore. Um, so my, I can't even tell you my origin of, or of the passion that I have for this stuff. I, it's been there my whole life. Um, but to actually become an ichthyologist and a National Geographic explorer, that's required a lot of, a lot of schooling. Um, so I'm finishing in, and I've been a student for all of my life seemingly. Uh, and moreover, I've put in a lot of time and effort. You know, I've put in a lot of work. I've gone through a lot of hardships. Uh, I've been sick and diseased and parasitized. Uh, countless times. And so, you know, to, to some degree, it's being tough. And to some degree, it's just loving what you do. But uh, I've always been passionate about it. And I've been lucky enough to be able to pursue those passions. All right, I'm going to uh, turn you all around because I've found a very, very beautiful uh, species of anemone. And I'm gonna have to get So, Joe, if you can still hear me, I think you're pushing uh, the limit of the satellite right now. We lost you. All right, boys and girls, we're going to have to wait until Joe uh, gets a little closer to the unit. I think he might have moved a little further away, a little excited that he found uh, that new species, but I hope you can see just how biodiverse this area is. Everywhere he goes, there's life, there's different species. It's a pretty incredible spot uh, to explore. So we're gonna give Joe a second. Hopefully he can get back closer to the unit um, and we can turn things over to questions. I guess I went too deep into that hole and lost you all. <laughs> you went too far, Joe, we lost you. You're back now, though. Yeah, I've resurfaced now. So, uh, yeah, I am. Sorry about that. There were I, some really beautiful strawberry anemones, and they had their tentacles out, which is unusual. So I really wanted to show it to everybody. It was worth the try. <laughs> All right, Joe, how do you feel about a few well, more I'm glad I could reconnect fairly quickly. I'd love to take questions. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's see, Mrs. Dillon's group in Farmington, Missouri. Let's get your microphone turned on. How are we doing, Farmington? Hello. Hi, we're getting ready to switch. Oh, right here. Hold on. Right here. Right here. What kinds of water testing do you do? We learned about pH today. So we try to characterize pH, conductivity, temperature, um, and dissolved oxygen, because those are pretty important parameters for fishes. But I'm planning to start analyzing water chemistry as well to look at the impacts of mining on freshwater ecosystems and also potentially looking at eDNA or environmental DNA where you can collect water samples and study the biodiversity using trace DNA. All That's right. a great question. Very cool. Uh, Mrs. Brown's class, grade sixes in Frederick joining us. Let's get their microphone turned on, see how they're doing. How are we doing, grade sixes? Good. All right, who's got a question? <laughs> you oh, hi, I'm Gabby. Thank you for letting us join you. Hi, Gabby. Um, you say you, you discover new species fairly frequently. How frequently would you say you discover new species? So about 10 to 15% of the species that we collect in Gabon, fish species that we collect in Gabon, are undescribed. Um, now we're collecting hundreds of fish species. So it's, we last, in 2017, I collected 12,000 fish in Gabon. Of those, we probably had 15 new species, but the new species generally are rare. 
So you catch fewer individuals that represent the new species than the more common species that are known. So out of a hundred fish, maybe one could represent a new species, but out of a hundred species, maybe 10 or 15 would be new to science, if that makes sense. All right, very cool. Um, let's see, let's go to Edmonton, Alberta, here in Canada. Mrs. Radomsky's grade fours are hanging out with us. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Hi. Edmonton? How are you doing? Hello. 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 Alicia, big loud voice. Um, I have two questions. One question. What's the biggest fish you've ever seen? Wow, ever seen? The biggest fish I've ever seen was a great white shark. Um, I was driving on a boat from Santa Cruz to Moss Landing, and we were fishing, and we saw a fin moving through the water, and it was swimming in the same way we were, and we said, let's go and look at it. And so we drove our boat kind of up and turned off the motor and just waited for the shark to swim up to us, and it swam right up to the boat. And I'm leaning on the edge of the boat with my phone trying to take a photograph of it. And it was probably a 10 foot long shark, probably weighed something like 300 pounds. Um, I remember thinking it's so, it's so, had I could have bit a big chunk of my body off in one bite. So that's the biggest fish I've ever seen. Um, and it was a great white shark and it was really big. All right, pretty cool, Joe. What about caught? What's the biggest you've ever caught? The biggest fish I've ever caught is actually probably a stingray. Um, so the San Francisco Bay is the biggest puppery for sharks and rays on the West Coast. And so during certain times of year, sharks and stingrays swim up into the San Francisco Bay and you can catch huge ones. Um, the biggest I've ever actually caught and held and taken a photo with was probably about a 60 pound bat ray. Um, so not huge. Most of the fish I catch are tiny. So one thing that's interesting about the work I do in Central Africa is, you know, 90% of the fish we catch are four inches or less. So these are really small fish. They're really popular in aquaria, but there aren't very many monster fish in the river systems and lake systems that I've studied. All right, let's jump to another classroom. We're going to go to Mrs. Rasika's group in Smooth Rock Falls, Ontario. Some great four, fives, and sixes. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Smooth Rock Falls? Good. Good. I have one question. How many species of anemone have you discovered, and which one is your favorite? You know, it's amazing how many anemones there are out here. When I was a kid, I just said, that's an anemone, and just left it at that. But I have found giant green anemones, uh, star sunburst anemones, moon glow anemones, uh, strawberry anemones. There are burrowing anemones. So at least five different, oh, and aggregating anemones. So at least six out here. Now, none of those are new to science, but they could be new to me because I am a scientist and I'm continuing to explore um, and there's a lot more to find. Uh, so one of the things that I always do is I look around and if I find something that I don't know what it is, and I've never seen it before, I always take a photograph to document it. And then I can use or that and someone can help me figure out what the biodiversity is. Now, I will say there have been a few things that I've found out here that nobody's been able to figure out what they are. I think that they're clams, boring clams, but I still have no idea what they are. So there's a lot out here um, and still more to discover, I'm certain. All right. And that's pretty exciting, Joe. I mean, a lot of students probably don't know this is literally like your front yard here. And every time you go down a low tide, it's just like a new, a new experience, new things to find, different species, changing environment. Pretty exciting. Yeah, you're, you're totally right, Joe. It's always different when you come down here. And even though I look around this area, you know, probably five times a month, every time I come down, I see something new or different 
or sometimes I see a really interesting interaction. Um, for example, that Hopkins rose that we saw, that tiny pink anemone, those are really rare here. They're really common down south, but I've only probably found two or three ever in this area. Um, so we're really lucky to see one today. And it's amazing. You never know what you're going to find when you start the day. All right. Well, and I good. didn't even find any fish today. That's the real pity. No eels, no pricklebacks, no sculpin, no, no rockfish, no cabazon. Next time, Joe. Well, you are limited. You can't go too far from the unit. So I understand. Uh, let's go back to Missouri. Do you guys have another question uh, in Farmington for Joe about fish or tides? We, we do, and we just had a group transition, but um, since we're in the Midwest, we don't know a lot about tide pools, so they kind of want to know a little bit about how they're created and if they last or do they go away? Are they always there? Yeah, you know, the intertidal area is basically a band around the ocean that is wet at high tide and dry at low tide. And then the actual environment that you encounter depends on the substrate. So I'm in a rocky area, but you can also have an inner tidal that's a beach, right? So at high tide, more of the beach is gonna be covered. At low tide, less of the beach is gonna be covered. Similarly, if you have muddy bottoms, you can end up with an inner tidal mud flat. So you find rocky inner tidals in areas where the ocean meets the land, but the, the substrate, the rocks are hard. So the rocks aren't broken down by the waves. They stay put. And so they're just splashed by waves, inundated by the water when the tide comes in. And it allows for organisms to attach onto it. That's the really important thing about the rocks is the rocks provide structure that the algae can grab onto, that the invertebrates can grab onto, and that allows for all of this ecosystem to flourish around me. But if you compared it to, for example, a sandy environment, the sand is so fine and so small and it's moving so much that any animal that attaches is gonna be knocked off and it's probably not gonna do very well. So one of the reasons that this rocky intertidal is here, that all these species are here is because of these hard rocks. And yes, over time there is erosion here, but, um, but the for hundreds of years and will be here for hundreds more years. Um, and the rocky intertidal may change, but until sea level changes, uh, this area will continue to be a rocky intertidal. All right, very cool. Um, Mr. Rasiga's class will join your class one more time. See if you guys have a, a final question for us. Yep. We do. What do anemones eat and how long do they live? So anemones are deposit feeders mostly. So they are, they're, they're suspension feeders. So they've got these tentacles, they're sticking up in the water. They don't have eyes. They can't see anything. They're just waiting for anything to get blown into their tentacles. Once they grab hold of them, their tentacles are sticky and also sting. And so once they grab a hold of anything, then they sting it, sting it, sting it, immobilize it, and then they stick their stomach out to digest it. So there are a lot of things in the intertidal that can get knocked off and become prey for an anemone. I can think of, you know, there's so many snails out here. So there are these turban snails that are really common out here. I didn't even point them out because they're so abundant. Um, those things can get knocked off the rocks, swept into an anemone and eaten. Similarly, a mussel can get knocked off the rocks or a crab, even a drifting piece of kelp. And an anemone will eat pretty much anything it gets its hands on and can digest. So you'll often see an anemone at the end of a meal spitting back out kind of the exoskeleton of a crab or a snail. And it's just spitting it back out empty and it's digested everything that's not hard. All right. Well, Joe, I've got to say a huge thank you uh, for hanging out with us today. It's early in the day for you, but a lot of our classrooms are starting to duck out now because lunch is coming on the East Coast. So uh, I'm at probably around breakfast time for you. So thank you for getting up a little bit early, making sure the satellite worked, mucking around in the tide for us and showing us an incredible amount of biodiversity in such a small little area. 
Yeah, you know, it's amazing. We only covered probably on in linear feet, probably 20 feet. And we saw all that diversity. And, you know, there's so much more out there. So I'm happy to share it. I'm sorry that we couldn't really get in the holes together because that's where that's where you find the crazy stuff. But, you know, to some degree, all of this stuff is crazy and I shouldn't be too picky. All right. Absolutely. Well, boys and girls, thanks so much for hanging out. The last thing we'll do before we sign out today is I'm going to turn the mics on and you're going to have to be nice and loud because a few classrooms have ducked out. So let's get nice and loud and make a bye and thank you for Joe. Here we go. All right. Awesome job, thank Joe. You. Thanks so much. Great species. That nudibranch was awesome. The bat star came in really clear. So, so cool. Um, we look forward to doing this again with you sometime and, uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, safe travels. And I look forward to seeing you a little later this week. Sounds good. Thanks again to all the teachers and classrooms and Joe, thanks. Explore classroom is awesome.